Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Your word is the truth. We receive your word this day, written in our heart, written in our mind, and we thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you as we have a ready reception for it. We're taking hold of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. We thank you it's going to bring forth much fruit in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. <coughs> we are sharing with you on the subject of the fruit of the Spirit, and we're specifically talking about the fruit of love. As we began talking about that today, we talked about God's love towards you and your love towards God. We pointed out the fact how the Father loves us, how he loved Jesus. We saw how he does love the believer with an everlasting love. We saw many scriptures showing how the Father loved Jesus because of the things that he did as far as obedience and following him. And because the fact that as we walk in the ways of the word of God, and he's going to love us. We pointed out there's two aspects to love. One, God's attitude towards us and the way he views us and the fact that he loves every single person, realizing that we are valuable, precious, and of great importance. But there's another aspect of his love is that his love is toward those who love him, as you will see, and he manifests himself towards those who love him. He does not manifest himself to all unless they respond and love him. And we saw many scriptures showing this. We also talked about how he demonstrated his love towards us through Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son. When love is an operation, it's going to give out to meet the needs of people. And of course, that was the need. We needed a savior. We also talked about the fact that the, all the principles, many principles through the word of how we show God that we love him. Because not only do we understand that God loves us, but also we must understand how we show him that we love him. It's not just an attitude, I love you. It's shown by action, it's shown by our works, it's shown by our deeds, it's shown by the things that we do. It is not just shown by words or just an attitude of heart. So we talked about many things and we're going to pick up and cover a few of the scriptures that we already looked at. We might point out that this particular word, the agape, when we talk about the love of God, is a word that realizes the valuableness the preciousness and the great worth of an individual. God considers everybody valuable, precious, and of great worth. And he wants everybody to come to walk in his ways. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. We're talking specifically about the fruit of love. And he wants us to see the fruit of love be established in us. We're going to look at a few scriptures that we looked at this morning and many, of course, that we haven't at all. So we began this this morning. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, we saw our attitude towards the Lord. It says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. We can't do things half-heartedly. It must be with all of our being. You know, those people that do things half-heartedly, you know, those are lukewarm people. They get spewed out of his mouth. You must love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. We saw in Joshua, in chapter 22, in verse 5. Joshua 22, verse 5. It says, take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. As you take diligent heed to do the commandments of the Lord, you show that you love the Lord. And you will walk in his ways and keep his commandments and you will cleave unto him. Over in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, in chapter 33, Ezekiel chapter 33, in verse 31, we see something that reveals importance for us having the, the true love of God. He goes on and he says, They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words. Many people have heard God's words, but they will not do them. They will not do the things they've heard. For with their mouth they show much love. We pointed out that we can say a lot of things, 
But if we don't have action to back it up, words mean nothing. But their heart goeth after their covetousness. See, that's got to be with all your heart, because out of your heart comes your motivations, your intentions, the desires. Everything that you do with your, all your heart is what really is on the inside of you. God wants you to love Him with all of your heart. And if you do, when you hear God's Word, you're going to respond to it. You're going to do what He says. You're going to be ready to carry it out in your life. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't follow Him. He says, Lo, art thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do not do them. This is why it is absolutely imperative that every one of us are doers of the word that we hear. If we just hear and we don't take hold of the instruction of the Lord and the word that he gives us, it's never going to profit us. And we don't show the fact that we love the Lord. The ones that love him are the ones that do the things that he says. We see over in Matthew in chapter 10. In Matthew in chapter 10, verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It's important that we understand that when this is talking about love here, it's a different Greek word. You've got to always look up words to be sure what's being said. This is not the word agape, the normal word for love, realizing the valuableness, preciousness, and worth of an individual. This particular word is the word phileo. And this is the word for being fond of or like considering one as a friend or where you are pleased with someone or you have love out of pleasure, you're, you're happy about what they do. He that loves or has pleasure of father, mother, more than me is not worthy of me. Otherwise, they're going to respond to what family wants. They're going to respond to a mother, a father, son, or daughter over the word of God. They have, they're more fond of pleasing them instead of pleasing God. He says, we're not worthy of him. You've got to put God's word first place and put him first place in your life. That means we cannot compromise the word of God for anybody. We can't compromise it for husband, wife, father, mother, son, daughter, relative, who doesn't matter who it is. The word of God needs to be put as final authority over your life, and you're going to put that first place. You're going to walk in it. That's what needs to be over all of our households as well. You put God's word first place in your household, and that's the way the whole household's going to live, and that's the way we're going to walk, then you're going to see that God's going to be moving in that household and every single person. And those that will not, you have to restrain them from evil and bring them, not allow them to go outside of the line of the word of God. You can't make them make the choices, but you can restrain them from evil, and that's important. You cannot let people in your household carry on destructive works. Otherwise, Curses will come on the whole household. Remember what happened to Eli. Eli did, not, Eli did not restrain his sons. His sons died, and he also died. It cost him because he did not do the word of God. We can never love any person above the Lord. Otherwise, we are not worthy of him. In Matthew chapter 24, we saw another verse that is very important for these last days. In Matthew chapter 24, this is a chapter on end time events that are going to be Occurring. Some have already occurred, some are occurring, and some will occur as we proceed down these end time days. In Matthew 24, 12, it says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. This is talking about Christians. Many people have tried to say that Matthew 24 is talking about the Jews, and the Christians aren't here. They think they're already gone and all that. That's why they kind of explain things away. Well, this is not talking about the Jews. This is talking about Christians. Why? Because the word love is the word agape. Who has the agape love of God? Only born-again believers. Remember, he said, a new commandment I give you, that you would love one another. It's a brand new commandment. It is a, a love without reservation, an unconditional love, a love realizing people are valuable and precious and of great importance, a love that will enable you to love your enemies. This is only for those that are born-again believers in Jesus Christ. So this is talking about Christians. It says the love of many, and many means a large amount. It doesn't mean just a few. It doesn't mean just a few here and there. It's a large amount of believers' love is going to wax cold. The Bible says there's going to be a falling away before the end comes. It's going to happen, unfortunately. 
And one of the reasons is because iniquity is going to abound, which is lawlessness. It is a Greek word, anomia, as you see. Anomia comes from the word nomos, which means law, and a, a prefix, which means not or without, as this means without law and referring to lawlessness. Many people think that they can just do whatever they want to do as a Christian. They think, oh, I thought we're under grace, we can just do whatever we want. Grace has conditions, and the, the grace speaks of the New Testament, but the New Testament has law. Many people have thought, well, I thought that the law was passed away, and we're not under the law anymore. Well, that's right, the Old Testament law has passed away, and we're not under it anymore, but you must realize as there was a change in the covenants and a change in the priesthood. As it says in Hebrews 7.12, the priesthood being changed, there's made of necessity a change also of the law. We're under a different law. What are we under? The law of the New Testament, the law of Christ, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It is now the law of love. You and I are to walk after the way of the New Testament. We are under law, but not Old Testament law. We are under New Testament law now and under the commandments of the New Testament which you and I are ex expected to obey and follow and walk after. Because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. It's happened in the world, but unfortunately it's going to be such that it's going to affect the body of Christ, such that they will not walk in those ways. And if the love of many will wax cold if we don't put the word of God first place. We'll be hot on fire for the Lord and always be walking in his ways if we put the word of God first place. But unfortunately, if the word is not being taught, how are people going to have the word? If they're not taught to get in the word, they're not spending time studying the word, they don't know the word, how are they going to walk in the ways of the word? They're not going to be able to. And they're going to walk in their own ways, in the flesh, or after whatever it seems right in their own sight, which will end up being sin. And the love of many will wax cold and they will be in trouble. This is why you and I must make sure that we are putting the word first place, hearing the word, doing the word, getting the word in us. And that is essential. Another scripture we saw this morning, very important, is over in Luke in chapter 7. <clears throat> we see here, we picked up down here in verse 44 about this woman that came to Jesus. And... Jesus spoke about this woman who had all these sins in her life. And he said, that, said, See this woman, I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. She's washed my feet with tears. She wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst anoint. This woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto her, Sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You see, as you respond to God in your life, and you turn towards Him, and you love His Word, and you do what He says, you're going to be loving Him. And as you respond to Him, you're going to be turning away from sin. You're going to be turning away from the ways of the flesh. You're going to be turning away from the ways of the world. And as you love the Lord, you're going to be, of course, turning away from sin, and you're going to be repenting, confessing it, and you're going to be forgiven. Therefore, in the measure that we have dealt with sin in our life is the measure that we have come to the place of loving Him. Many people have thought, well, I confessed all my sins. Uh, there are, uh, that's all I need to do. Everything is fine, and I got no more problems. We need to understand that every one of us are progressively dealing with areas of sin in our life as God reveals them. We know from Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That means any time we're outside of faith, it's sin. We're walking after our feelings, it's sin. We're walking after, in the way of the natural, responding out of me, 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 I, 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 what I feel, it becomes sin. And so we miss the mark, not sharing the prize, give place to the enemy in our life. These are sins of commission, of course, when we do evil things. But another thing you've got to realize, in James chapter 4, verse 17, it reveals something very important. Therefore, him that knoweth to do good, he has knowledge, he knows what he's supposed to do, and doeth it not, he's not doing it. To him it is sin. That means these are sins of omission, not doing the word that we know. God tells us to do such and such, we don't do it, it's an area of sin. I'm not doing anything bad, 
But if I'm not doing what he said, it's still an area of sin. Therefore, as you and I get the knowledge of God, we have to incorporate it into our lifestyle and be a doer. But if we are, then it is going to, of course, produce righteousness. We're obedient to his word, producing righteousness, and we'll show that we love him. That's why it's important to realize every one of us, as we study the word, we've got to know the word so we can walk in it so we won't sin. Because it's not just sins of commission, it's also sins of omission. This, again, of course, is why we've got to know the Word of God. If you haven't studied the Word of God much and you don't know it, how are you going to be able to walk in the ways of the Lord? You won't. That's why getting the Word of God in you is of primary importance in your life. You need to study it, hear it, and put it into operation in every area of life. Over in John chapter 14, verse 15, another important scripture. If you love me, keep my commandments. If we really love the Lord, we're going to keep the commandments of God. We're going to do the things that he has commanded us to do. We're going to hearken unto his word and be obedient. We see also down in verse 21. He says, he that hath my commandments, and how would we get his commandments? We studied the word and we found them out, or we heard the word. That's why you've got to hear the word, get it. And keepeth them. That means he's paying attention to them. He's taking heed to them. He's holding on to them. He's incorporating them into his lifestyle. He's a doer of it. He it is that loveth me. That means the person that says, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. Well, that sounds great, but it's got to have something else to it. You can't say, I love you, and not do what he says. He that has my commandments and keeps, him, keeps them, he it is that loves me. You know, this tells you that there's a lot of Christians out there that from God's perspective, they don't love Jesus. If you ask them on the street, run into them and say, hey, do you love Jesus? Sure, I love Jesus. They'll all say that. But from God's perspective, they don't love Jesus if they're not doing his word. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And that's another important point. When you love God as he says to love him, he's going to love you back. He loves us all in a general sense in the fact that he sees everybody as valuable, precious, and important. He wants us to get saved. He wants us to walk in his ways. He wants us to receive Jesus. He wants us to hearken unto him. And he loves us, giving his word to us. But he doesn't manifest himself to those that do not receive what he says. He manifests himself to those that have his commandments and keep them and do them. He that loves me, he that loves me shall be loved of my Father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. God will come and manifest. He'll reveal himself to you. He'll manifest himself in some way, give you revelation, give you understanding, manifest his promises, his power, whatever it might be. Many Christians don't ever see God's manifestation. They don't even think he's a God of power. They just think he's some distant God out there. No, he's a God who wants to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with you that you would know him and that he would know you and you would know his ways, and you would walk in his ways, and live by the power of God, and see his fruit, see his workings come in your life, and develop a personal, intimate fellowship with him. Verse 23, Jesus said, If a man love me, he will keep my words. In other words, in the measure that you keep his words, doing his word, is the measure that we love him. And what's going to be the result? My father will love him. That means the Father's not going to love him if he's not keeping his words. He has a general love towards the person, but he's not going to manifest himself. It says we, that's the Father and Jesus, will come unto him and make our abode with him. God will come and abide in us and make his abode in us and reveal himself. Why does he reveal himself and, and manifest his promises, blessings, and power, and all these things to one and not to another? Because one has met the conditions and the other is not. Until we meet the conditions, we're not going to see God manifest himself. Now, verse 24 is very important. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. What that tells you is the guy who is not a doer of the word in keeping his word, he does not love God, regardless of what his attitude is. But most Christians, they don't realize this. They think that, well, I'm born again, I love God, just an attitude of heart. No, it's shown in action. When you love him, you are going to keep his words. He said, the word which you hear is not mine, otherwise I didn't come up with this. 
He says, but it's the Father that sent me. Because remember, everything that Jesus spoke, he didn't speak any of himself. He only spoke the things that the Father gave him. Just as the Holy Spirit didn't originate anything, he, he takes the things that Jesus spoke to him from above. These things are all coming from our Heavenly Father that brings revelation of the truth to us. Over in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 16, verse 22, we see an important, important statement. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, or Marin, and, uh, and Maranatha means the Lord has come. Let him be anathema. That means let the guy be like he's cursed. That's what that essentially refers to. If a many man love not, now what kind of love is it talking about here? It's not talking about agape. It's the word phileo. We must love him in the sense that we are pleased with him, we are fond of him, we're like a friend to him because we walk in his ways. And who's the friend of God? the one who keeps his commandments. Remember what it says in John. If you keep my commandments, then you are my friends because we walk in his ways. We are to phileo the Lord Jesus. If we don't, we're anathema, like accursed. And we're not going to be walking in God's blessings. He's not going to be accomplishing, able to accomplish the things that he wants in our life. Over in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without him, without blame, before him in love. We've been chosen. We've been called and chosen to come out of darkness and come into relationship with him. Notice this has been before the foundation of the world. What's he expect of us? That we would be holy. That we would be without blame before him in love. As you walk in the love of God, walk in obedience to Him, doing His Word, you're just going to produce holiness. Obedience to God's Word produces righteousness that brings fruit unto holiness that produces everlasting life. And we've seen that. We talked about fruit. That we should be without blame before Him in love, without blemish. See, God's going to have a holy church. The type of church that Jesus comes back to for is one that's holy, without blame, without blemish, unrebukable, unreprovable before the Lord. We're all going to be holy. Without holiness, no man's going to see the Lord. You're going to be holy because you're going to walk in His ways, and it's going to be produced through the Word of God. That's why it says, be holy, become holy as I am holy. God would never tell us to be something if it couldn't happen. Now, how's it going to happen? Through the Word. God's Word is producing. You can't do it in your own ability, but as you do God's Word, He produces it in you. But He can't produce it in you if you don't do what He says. God's the one who accomplished it, but it's as we carry out His Word. So, as we're going to be walking before him in love, doing what he says, it's going to produce holiness, and you and I are going to be without blame before the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we see over here in verse 8, a scripture we were looking at at the end this morning, but another one we need to bring up again. Wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. If you confirm your love, it means you're going you're gonna to verify this, you're going to ratify this, you're going you're to make this uh, shown forth to him, make it valid, as he says here, or ratify it. Well, how are we going to show forth our love? Because you show it forth. It's going to be seen by your walk. He goes, to this end, also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. How are we going to show the fact that our love is true and are sincere and, and the real deal? It's because obedience in all things. God has given us his word, which is the word of the covenant. You've got to understand, when we got born again, we came into covenant relationship with God. And his word is the word of the covenant. God has bound himself by his word, <clears throat> which is the word that he's going to have to perform. He's going to, he, he swore by himself, he could swear by no greater, and he watches over his word to perform it. You've got to understand, God cannot go outside of his word, or he would be sinning. He's never going to do that, of course. At the same time, you and I have been given the word not just for nice principles, good ideas, something I'll try to do when I can. No, it's the word of the covenant. And you and I must take hold of our responsibilities to do the word so that God then can perform his promises which necessitates obedience in all things. That's why we work out our salvation with fear and trembling as we're obedient in all things, 
obeying him always, as the word says. We see, saw another scripture regarding this line over in 2 Corinthians 8.8 8, where it says, I speak not by commandment, by the occasion of the frowardness or the diligence, this means, of you. It's a word spade, spade, meaning diligence. And to prove the sincerity of your love. The word sincerity could be understood as being genuine or, or that's not only sincere but genuine, something that's true, the real deal. He's going to prove the genuineness of our love. How's it going to be shown? By what you do. If he tells you to do something, he's going to find out if you're going to do it. He goes on here in verse 24, he says, Wherefore, show you to them and before the churches the proof of your love. You're going to show it. How are you going to show it? Because you're going to have the fruit. See, that's why he says, I know them by their fruits. That's how you know people. Your fruits are all your, the results of your doings, of your actions, all the things that you carry out. That's why he comes to give us according to the fruit of our doings. What you do is the key. This is why your works are so important. This is why he says to every one of the churches in the seven Revelation, the seven letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, he starts out, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works. Because your works show forth not only your faith, your works show forth your love for him and whether you're really walking in the ways of the Lord. And that is of paramount importance. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 7, he says how we are to have an attitude of, of giving unto the Lord. And what we do, he says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, everything's got to be from heart. It can't be just going through the motions. It can't be because I ought to or I have to. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, not because I ought to or should, for God loveth the cheerful giver. He wants a willing heart. We give in obedience with a willing heart. The willing and obedient eat the good of the land. So God loves a cheerful giver. This is one who is a joyous giver. And you're going to give joyously because you have a heart for love, love to him. You want to pay tithes and give of offerings and, and be a blessing and give and do the things that God wants you to do. And what's going to happen when you do that? God's able to make all grace abound towards you. Do you always have an all sufficiency in all things? That means God will always cause you to have all sufficiency in all things. And you may even abound to every good work. That's abundance left over to be able to even give to other good works to help support the gospel. He wants us to have this kind of an attitude. We also see a scripture over in 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we see what's going to happen in the end times. The Antichrist is going to come on the scene and he will be coming after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, which is how people are going to be deceived because they follow after these things instead of following the word. And with all dece unde deceivableness of unrighteousness, this is why we've got to have righteousness as our standard, which is what? The word of righteousness. In them that are perish, because they received not the love of the truth. We must receive the love of the truth. And what's that? That's the word of God, the truth. We must have the love of the truth. Understanding the truth is valuable, precious, of great importance, and we've got to put it first place and do it in our life, that they might be saved. God wants you to get the Word of God, the love of the truth. The truth is what is important. We brought messages on the truth recently, how important it is for us to obtain it and walk in it, to see God bring forth freedom and liberty and all the things that He wants to come forth in our life. Over in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, we see over in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot love the world and love God at the same time. They don't mix. Who's the God of this world? The devil. The world is wise in the embrace of the wicked one, the Bible says. But God says we're to be separate from the things of this world. We are to leave the world when we get born again. We should be leaving the world and separating from it. That's what water baptism is all about. They left Egypt, a type of the world. We leave the world. We don't walk in the ways of the world any longer. We're now walking according to heaven's ways because we're born from above. We are now uh, belong to him as we are part of the church of the firstborn which is from heaven. So we can't be valuing or looking at anything as important 
out there in the world. The things in the world either. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, not some, but all of it, everything out there. All that the world's always trying to get you to do all kinds of things in the flesh. Try to go after all kinds of things that are going to please the flesh in some way. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, strong desire of things that I want, lust of the eyes, pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. That's why you're to seek the things above, not the things on the earth. You've been raised from the dead, you've been, you are now in spiritually, you're in Christ, you're to walk after heaven's ways. Remember, your life is a short span compared to eternity. It's like a vapor. And you now that have your life, we all have our life, and we are to walk, work out our salvation. We are to walk in the ways of the Lord. We are to get the Word of God in us and learn the ways of the Lord, develop a personal, intimate fellowship with Him, conquer the enemy, conquer temptation, conquer sin, conquer everything of the enemy that's come into our life from inheritance, our own sins, or victimization, or whatever's happened. And we are to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with Him Get His Word in us and walk in His ways. Bring forth fruit in all areas of our life. Walk and live by the power of God. Serve Him and carry out the ministry of the Lord and live unto Him. Because we know that He died for us. We can't live unto ourselves. We now must live unto Him. And He says that all this of the world is not of the Father. It's of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Say, well, how can I determine if something's of the world or not? If it's not in line with the will of God, the Word of God, you know it's not of the Lord. You know it's of the, of the, of the world. Anything that's in line with the will of God, those are the things you do. Anything that is not in line with His Word, which is the will of God, it's of the world. It is leading you in a wrong path. The one who continually does the will of God, that's the one that abides in the Father in, in forever and is going to walk in the ways of victory, praise God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 21. This commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. You must love every person who's considered a brother, which would be a Christian. You're also supposed to love your enemies. We'll be seeing scriptures on that later on. You're to love every person. You're to love your brother. If you love God, you love your brother. If you can't love your brother, then you don't love God. Well, I have an attitude towards them because of what they did. It doesn't matter what they did. You're going to walk in love. You're going to forgive every person. If you won't forgive someone their sins, you're not forgiven of yours. You're abiding your sin. You're in trouble. You're not right with God. Every one of us must always forgive. Let go of all hurts, wounds, damage, emotions, whatever. Let go of the bitterness, the resentment. Put away all these things. All these things we must put underfoot, and we must love every person. Love is unconditional. Love is un without reservation. Love is not, doesn't have a string attached to it. We're going to love our brother, period. That doesn't mean we're going to fellowship with them. That doesn't mean that we're going to be doing things with them if they're not walking right. But we're not going to have an attitude towards them. We're not about to have any unforgiveness, resentments, bitterness, anger, holding grudges negatives no you do not let that get a hold of you you must love your brother otherwise you will not love god every that's imperative for every one of us many people try to justify their attitudes you can't justify your attitudes before the word of god before god there's no reason for you ever to have an attitude contrary to love towards every person first john chapter 5 verse 2 by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. You love God and keep His commandments, you're going to love every person, and you know that you love the children of God. We're going to be obedient to His Word. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. The love of God is not having an attitude of love. It's not having a feeling of love. Well, I don't feel love. It doesn't have anything to do with feeling love. It all has to do with the commandments and being obedient to do what they say. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. In the measure that you are keeping the commandments of God is the measure that you love God. In the measure that you are not doing them is the measure it shows you don't love God. 
And notice his commandments are not grievous. Don't think that we cannot do the commandments of the Lord. Every one of us can do them. Over in 2 John, in verse 6, this is love that we walk after his commandments. Pretty clear. And somebody says, what's love? Love is walking after his commandments, doing what he says. And this is his commandment that you've heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. If you walk in it, that you're a doer of it. It's leading and guiding you step by step. It's what you walk in all the time. Remember, there's never a justification for doing anything outside of love in any situation in life. If the church would realize that worldwide, we wouldn't have any problems going on all the strife and arguments and negative attitudes and all kind of petty little things that go on in churches, which is ridiculous. Revelation chapter 2. First of all, we see this first church here, that he speaks this to every single one of the seven churches. This one to the church at Ephesus. The first thing he says out of his mouth to every one of them is, I know thy works, because your works show forth your deeds, your actions, what you're doing. And he goes on and he says here in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. If God's to be our first love, loving with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength, putting the word first love, first place, they obviously quit doing it. They left their first love, and they weren't doing the things that God wanted. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and fell away, and repent, change your mind, so you start doing the right thing, and do the first works. See, the first works show that you have the, you're walking in the, after the first love. Your works, again, show whether you're walking in love or not. Again, it's not an attitude of mind. It's not an attitude of heart. It's all shown by your action. And there's quite a statement he makes after that. He says, or else, I'm going to come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That means the light's going out of you. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bad situation. You don't want to let that happen. You're going to walk in line with the word of God. And we're going to not ever leave our first love, which is the Lord and his word, and putting his word first place in our life is absolutely essential. We see over in John, chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. We're to continue. That means to abide in his love. We remain in it. We just don't love for a while and then you know, whatever someone does, we're going to respond negatively. No, you walk in love all the time. That's the only way you deal with people. There is never again any justification for you to get upset at people, get all bent out of shape, get bitter, get resentful, retaliate, you know, holding grudges. We see, actually, you can live above hurt. Why would we get hurt? Because they did something to me. They hurt me. They rejected me. They spoke evil words at me. It's all out of me, 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 I, I, I. And that's all out of the flesh. Do you live unto me? No. You live unto God. How are you to respond? You're to respond in the spirit. Jesus got rejected. Did he get beat up by the enemy? No. He just responded in the spirit. He always did the things the Father wanted him to do. You can live above hurt and not be hurt and wounded if you don't respond out of self out of your feelings, out of what someone, out of circumstances, out of the situation. That's why we've got to learn to live according to the ways of God and the Spirit. You can live. All your relationship problems will be, be solved if you put the Word of God first place and you live from the Spirit and always respond as God wants. It doesn't matter what people do to you. It's irrelevant because you're not going to respond according to what they do. You're only going to give them what God says. You're only going to respond the way he responds. And you can live above hurt. Is If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Notice, Jesus would not have ab been abiding in the Father's love unless he kept the Father's commandments. He had to do it. Well, the disciples not above the Master. You and I do the same thing. As you keep the commandments of God and do what he says, you're going to abide in his love at all times in your life. And he wants, it's very important that we do that. Look at the scripture in Jude, verse 21. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. 
God's telling you to keep yourself in the love of God. This is a command. It's imperative mood in the Greek. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Do your best. It didn't say do your best to keep yourself in the love of God. It's a command. God says, I'm commanding you, keep yourself in the love of God. And what do we, as we do, we're looking for or ready to receive, accepting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto what? Eternal life. You want to have eternal life? You want to see God's mercy come forth eternal life? Keep ourselves in the love of God. It is absolutely of paramount importance. We see in 1 John chapter 2, over in verse 4, He that saith, I know him, lots of people say, well, I know the Lord, and keepeth not his commandments, he's a liar. That's what God says. Because you can't know him if you don't walk in love. And you cannot walk in love if you don't keep his commandments. The guy that says, I know him and keepeth not his commandments, he's a liar and the truth's not in him. From God's perspective, he's a liar. If the truth's not in us because we don't do the word, keeping his commandments, then we don't know him. And we're deceived. He says, but whoso keepeth his word, and this is the guy who is continually keeping his word, doing what he says. Here's the word down here. It's below it. It's in the present tense. This isn't the guy who kept it once or twice or a few times. This is the present tense. For you who are here for the first time, it's important to understand that the tenses, voice, and mood are very specific in the Greek to say what is being said. The present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. Otherwise, it says, who is keeping? But another thing is here, it shows also that this is a subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is not the mood of reality. This is a mood that expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, when God makes a statement in the subjunctive mood, what he's going to say here about the love of God being perfected in you, which is what the promise is here, it only can happen if you meet the conditions. It's not automatic. Whoso may keep his word continuously, literally is what you, the way you translate this, in him verily is the love of God perfected. And aren't we all supposed to go on to perfection in the Lord? We are, to be holy before him. So God wants you to keep his word. In the measure that you're continually keeping the word is the measure that the love of God's been perfected in you, in your life. And how also hereby know we that we're in him. So you're going to come to the place where you know you're in him. You're not like, I hope I'm in him. You know you're in him because you walk with him. You know, I hope I know God. No, you know God. You have a revelation of him because of the word in you. Praise God. Now, as you walk in line with God's word and you do the things that he's told you to do, great blessings and promises will come to pass. We see a phrase that you're going to see in many of these scriptures, to them that love him. And that's the condition. To them that love him, those that meet his conditions, as we saw from this morning and some additional ones this evening, then the blessings belong to those. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. That's the condition. And keep my commandments. Of course, he brings out the one who loves him is the one who keeps his commandments. Again, what does that show? Your works, your doings, the fruit in your life, that is what God sees. That's why he says, I know, how do we know people? By their fruit. No fruit, you're not walking right. In fact, what happens to the guy that doesn't have any fruit? Remember, he's a brain, he's take, take, you take that branch away and cast him off. No. We got to, your works are so important. So many people just want to ignore our works, our doings, and think, well, you know, I'm saved by grace, everything's fine. Oh, uh, no, not quite. You came into relationship with him because of God's grace, and now all of his grace and all of his promises will come to pass if you meet the conditions, because grace has conditions, as we've talked about we did the series on grace. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. God's mercy will come to pass for you. And what's the mercy of God? It's the love of God in action towards you. When he talks about his mercy, 
His mercy is when he split the Red Sea. His mercy when he destroyed Og and, and all these different kings and, and the famous kings. You looked in the Psalms, it talks about his mercy that was enduring forever, delivered them and healed them and set them free from bondages. What were those blind men calling out for? Have mercy on me, son of David. What are they looking for? Healing to be manifest. The mercy of God is the love of God in action that will be manifest in your life to bring the promises of God. Grace is his attitude, his favor towards you, but mercy is action shown forth on your behalf. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, we see the same thing brought out. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Keeping the commandments is essential if you're going to see the mercy of God. You might try to come boldly to take hold of the mercy of God as to the throne of grace to take hold of mercy, but if you aren't keeping His commandments, it's not going to get anywhere. You have to walk the walk if you're going to be able to see it. You can't just take a scripture, I'm going to claim this scripture, and then ignore the rest and not walk in them and see you're going to see a promise. It isn't going to happen whatsoever. This is why the whole Word has to be taught, not just people teaching a scripture, and then we're going to act on this scripture, and then wonder why it didn't happen. Well, what about all the other scriptures we kind of ignored? Well, we can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath that he'd sworn unto your fathers, God has to keep his word, remember, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of Bomb and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. What does that tell you? God loves you, and his love is shown by his action. Just because God said, oh, I love you. No, he's got to act and show it too. His action was to perform the oath that he swore. He brought them out with a mighty hand and redeemed them. God shows his love to you by his actions in performing his word in your life. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he's God, the faithful God. He's faithful just like you and I got to be faithful. Which keeps covenant and mercy, but there are conditions. It's not automatic with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God, he's responsible. That's why you got to know God. You got to know God will do his word. He'll perform it. See, how can I know what God will do? How can you ever be in faith if you don't know what he'll do? The only way you can be in faith, it's not just I'm just believing that God will do it and hoping maybe he'll do it. No, you know what he'll do. That's why you know you have what you prayed. You know the things that you have acted upon. You know it's coming to pass because you meet the conditions and you know that God is going to perform his word as well. Look over here in Deuteronomy 23, verse 5, where what he'll do. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam. He's not going to hearken to anybody that's doing anything wrong. Balaam was doing wrong things. But the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. God had already said that he was going to protect them. And so he turned the curse into a blessing. He tried the curse and it wouldn't work. Blessing came. Because God is not going to let things come to pass that are not of the Lord when they're spoken from evil sources. That is, if you've met the conditions. See, now many people say, well, I thought the Lord, he must be allowing all these evil things to happen. No, that's the devil bringing those things. God's not, quote, allowing it. You're allowing it by allowing thing, evil things to come. But regarding God's word, when God, you've met the conditions, and when God's word is set, he is going to make sure that he performs his word. He will not let the enemy work when you've met the conditions. And he will perform. That's how he protects you. That's how he dwells in safety. That's why how he'll keep you from evil that tries to come against you. And he'll, you know, it doesn't matter what the enemy wants to bring against you. You know, when you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord, the enemy will come against you one way, he'll flee seven ways. Why? Because God's power will be in operation. But why? Because you met the conditions. You did the word. Then God's going to perform his word in your life. And he'll turn curses into blessings. Praise God. Deuteronomy 30. Verse 16. See, that's why you don't have to be afraid of curses coming at you. If you deal with them properly, you're not going to have any problems if you do things the way what God says. Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. 
in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Again, that shows you. How do we know if you love him? You're keeping his commandments, you're walking in his ways. That thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. How are the showers of blessings going to come upon you, as we talked about when we we're talking about fruit? How are these blessings going to come on you and overtake you and come and get you, and you can't even get away from them, as it talks about in Deuteronomy 28? Because you've met the conditions. You've hearkened unto his voice. You've kept his commandments. You've done what he told you to do. You're going to live. You're going to multiply. He's going to not only make you fruitful, he's going to multiply you and bless you. He's going to bless you as you go to possess the enemy's land. The land that you go to possess. The word possess, by the way, means to go and seize and take possession of it. We're going to go, uh, uh, strong concordance means to occupy by driving out previous enemies. This particular word, Yerash, means. So you and I are going to drive out the enemies and we're going to possess the promises in our life. You see, in the areas where you haven't possessed the promises and the enemies have come in, you got a bunch of evil spirits that are hindering you and blocking you from seeing blessing. That's why. Why did he say cast out the demons? Because that's the way you get rid of everything that's come into you from inheritance, from the inherited generational iniquity curses, from your own sins or victimization in life. And if you don't cast out the demons, they're still there and they're going to work against you and they're going to war against you and they're going to keep you in bondage until you drive them out. Of course, the whole body of Christ basically has been deceived thinking that we don't have any demons in us when we're born again which is a lie. It's the opposite. We all have them in us. Every one of us needs to cast out. So as you go to possess, to drive the enemies out, God's blessings are going to come upon you. That shows the fact that you, gotta be, you and I have to be in the warfare mode if we're going to see the victory come forth in our life. Judges chapter 5. That's why I always had them have a sword. He said every place they were always using a sword. Go in and smite your enemies, right? What's the sword? Your mouth speaking, warring against the enemies, attacking the enemies as you cast out, you war with your mouth as you cast them out and destroy them. We see over there in Judges 5, 31. So all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest forty years. Notice, you love him, what's going to happen? God's going to go forth in his might, in his mighty force, his strength, and the enemies are going to perish, and they're going to be driven out because God's going to fight the battle. Remember, the battle's the Lord's, and the victory's ours because we're going to speak the word. We're going to love him. We're going to do what he says. We speak him, speak his word to release him to accomplish his word. Who does the work in the spirit? God does. The angels that go forth to minister for us the heirs of salvation, they will confront all these demons and destroy their works. That's why you always got to be functioning in the spirit. And what happened? They are blessed. The land had rest 40 years. No enemies were coming by them any longer. They had rest. They had peace. They had victory. They had deliverance. They had freedom. That's what God wants to bring forth in your life. He's, he, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hadn't changed a bit. He's looking for us to do what he says. Nehemiah 1, verse 5. Here he says, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Again, we see this, keeping of covenant and mercy. Over in Psalms 31, Psalms 31, verse 23, look what he says. Oh, love the Lord, all ye saints. That's our responsibility. For the Lord preserveth, this means he guards and watches over, the faithful. Evidence that you love the Lord is you're faithful. You're faithful to do what he says. And what's he going to do? He's going to preserve you. He's going to watch over you. He's going to guard you. God will watch over you and guard you. You mean you can be safe and protected. And he plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. God is going to reward you plentifully. He's going to reward you abundantly, recompense you abundantly as Young's brings out. That means God's going to bring forth his blessings. You have to know God's not holding anything back. In fact, the Bible says he withholds no good thing from those that walk uprightly. The Lord wants his showers of blessings and his blessings to come on you, to overtake you and manifest. Why isn't it happening in people's lives? Because we haven't met the conditions. You meet the conditions, God will meet the conditions. He already swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. This is why we've got to come in line with doing the things that he says. Look at Psalms 91. 
Psalms 91. Here in verse 14, it says, Because he hath set his love upon me. You set your love upon him? How do we set our love upon him? We keep his commandments. We do what he says. We're obedient in all things. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he's known my name. You call on the name of the Lord. You start speaking in the name of the Lord. You have dominion over the enemy. God's going to deliver you. He's going to set you on high. That means you rise above all the storms of life, the attacks of the enemy. You're walking in victory. You're walking in authority and victory. Praise God. God will deliver you. He goes on and says, He shall call upon me and I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. This is all because of the fact that you set your love upon him. What great promises. God will deliver you, set you on high. You call on him. He's going to respond. That's answered prayer. He's going to be with you in time of trouble to bring you through and bring you out of it, to deliver you. And God even says that he's going to honor you and me. Psalms 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Or to hate it, remember, we talked about this. He preserveth the souls of his saints, and he delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. This word, shamar, means to guard. He's going to guard the soul. That's your soul. He'll guard your mind, your emotions, your will, the attacks that try to come against you. Because if you walk in line with the word, the enemy's not going to get to you. So you don't have to get beat up emotionally, mentally, all these things coming at you. Well, why have I had such problems? Because we didn't do what he said. If we do what he said, we would have never let the enemy come in to begin with. If you love the Lord and you hate evil, you're not going to give place to sin. You're going to do his commandments. And what's going to happen? He's going to preserve you. He's going to guard the souls, which is your will, intellect, and emotion of his saints. But notice, you've got to be a saint. That's the faithful one, the holy ones that are walking. Not just the ones that call, say, I'm born again. And it's the saints, the ones that are walking right. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. God will deliver you out of every enemy in your life. Psalms 119, 165. Look what he says. Great peace have they that love thy law. Remember, when you love his word, you do what he says. What's going to happen? Great peace. That means you can abide in peace at all times in your life. It means I don't have to have any anxiety, worry, Concern, fear, get upset, get troubled, get all flustered, all these things. That's all the flesh. That's all responding to circumstances. That's getting our eyes off the Lord and uh, responding to what the enemy's doing out there in situations, people, in the world, all these things. And nothing shall offend them. Nothing. You put the word of God first place and you love his law, nothing's going to offend you. No, we're not going to. And the word fend means to stumble. We're not going to stumble. You don't have to stumble. Remember in the New Testament, it says, he'll keep you from falling. It says in Jude, verse 24. We don't have to fall. We don't have to stumble. We don't have to get offended over anything in our life. Praise God. We're going to walk the right way. Also, we are, the Bible talks about how we're to love Jerusalem and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalms 22, verse 6. Now, those Jews, of course, some that have come to the Lord, most all of them have not. You know, they're enemies for the gospel's sake for, but they're still, they're important to God because they're part of his ones that he has made a covenant with, and he's going to perform his promises. As the Bible talks about, as the last dealings are going to come to Israel, the gospel's going to be preached in those last three and a half years, and they're going to come to repentance. All Israel's going to be saved. The promises in, in Romans on that. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We should always be praying. Don't ever get against Jerusalem or not support Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. You want to prosper? You want to be on God's side. Don't get contrary to it. You know, when Britain turned away from Israel, they lost all their, they had great dominion throughout their, their empire. And when they turned away from them, they started losing everything. It'll happen. You won't prosper. You won't be blessed if you've ever studied that out. That's what happened in history. Psalms 145, verse 20. So prosperity is tied into you loving him. Verse 20 says, The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked shall he destroy. Again, he preserves. He guards. You've got this promise over and over and over. We see it in Proverbs chapter 4, and verse 6. All these great promises for those that love him. 
Forsake her not, she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. This is talking about wisdom here, which is the result of you hearing and doing the word of God. Love her, wisdom is going to keep you and guard you. So you always walk in the ways of the Lord. You'll have wisdom. If you have wisdom, you won't be making mistakes. That's why I said get wisdom. Many people don't have wisdom. Maybe they do things and make mistakes. They have all kinds of problems. Proverbs 8, 17, look what it says. I love them that love me. That shows you that God's love is not, this is talking about a love that's going to manifest for people. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. It means he just doesn't, he has a general love towards everybody who wants them to be saved, of course. He sent Jesus. But we're talking about God's love towards a person manifesting. He loves those that love him. If you don't love him, he's not going to love you and manifest himself to you. That's important. Many people just assume that God automatically is going to love them and do all these things. And then they wonder why God didn't do things. They want to blame God, get mad at God, get upset at God. God's not your problem. If anything negative is coming in, it's the devil. Who's the one who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? The devil. It's not God. God is not our problem. Look in verse 21. That I may cause those that love me, we see again this phrase, those that love me, to do what? Inherit substance and I'll fill their treasures. God will bring blessings. Inherit substance and fill their treasures. Praise God. They said a testimony of someone that because they've been loving God, they talked about how some money came into their hands was able to pay off all of their credit card debt. And they attribute it to the fact that they've been following after God, you know. Because, you know, following God, God will cause things to happen out there. So money came and it ended up paying off my debt. Praise God. They're all, they're excited. They're blessed. He'll cause you to inherit substance and I'll fill their treasures. I have also heard of cases where their inheritance got stolen. They should have got an inheritance in the natural, but they never got it for some reason. Wonder why the devil came in and stole it. Wonder why something happened here. Well, were they loving God? Were they following Him? You follow God, God will cause you to inherit substance, and He will fill your treasures. That's God's blessing that will come upon us in our life. We see in Daniel, chapter 9, it all comes down to whether we're loving Him or not. Verse 4, where Daniel was praying to him, and he said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, of keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him and to them that keep His commandments. Is keeping his covenant and mercy automatic? No. Is it going to happen just because I decide to pray even accurately the word and just pray exactly right and I take hold of it and I speak the word and I'm standing in faith and I know it's going to happen? If I don't keep his commandments, is it going to happen? No. In fact, the scripture that even shows you this tied into answered prayers down in 1 John chapter 3 in the New Testament where he talks about how in verse 22, Whatsoever we ask, the word is aiteo in the Greek, meaning demand of what's due us, we receive lombano, take hold of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do the things pleasing in his sight. Is it just because we prayed a perfect prayer in line with the word? And Well, you know, I got some sin in my life, but you know, that's no big deal. No, because I keep his commandments. That means you love God and you do the things that are pleasing in his sight. I love God. I'm meeting his conditions. Now you're going to see what you pray in line with the Word is going to come to pass, praise God, and He will bring great blessings unto us. We also see over in Romans, Romans chapter 8, Scripture we looked at this morning, but another one we had to look at again for a moment. Verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities or weaknesses, this means, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, or this means must, necessary is binding, it literally says. But the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, talking about spiritual prayer coming forth by the Holy Spirit. And he that searches the hearts knows what's the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And, this is linking what was just said with what follows, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. Now this is one of the verses that Christians all over take hold of and lay hold on this wonderful claim and say, 
I know that all things are working together for good to, to love God. They assume that they met the conditions because they have an attitude of love because I'm born again. Well, remember, we've already seen who loves God. The one who's doing his word, keeping his commandments. So they may not have met the conditions at all. At the same time, they're assuming that all things that are happening must be working together for my good. Is sickness, disease working together for your good? No, it's death and operation. Are car accidents working for your good? No. Is poverty working for your good? No. Anything that the devil's bringing working for your good? No. Is it talking about all things that are, that are happening? No. It's talking about all things that God is doing. And why is that? Because you've been praying, which is about verse 26 and 27, because it ties together and, and means it ties together with what was being said with what's following. And also, it's another thing as we see this more literally what it says by what Young's brings out in the word order in the Greek. Notice what Young says. This is Young's literal translation. Probably the finest especially New Testament translation that is there, that is out in the world today. And we have known, literally, because this is a perfect tense verb, that to those loving God, literally is what it says. Now there's the condition. All things do work together for good. And why is that? Because those that are loving God are hearing His Word, doing His Word, they're praying His Word is in the context. And God's released, and guess what? He's at work. He's performing His Word. And all things that he's doing are working together for your good. I guarantee you, all things the devil is doing are not working together for your good. So it's not talking about all things that happen because the devil is out there doing things, you know. So that's not the talking about the devil. It's all things that God is doing are working together for good to those who are literally the called according to his purpose. So don't fall for this tradition and think that, well, everything's working together for my good. And, well, and I'll just, I don't understand it. I don't see why uh, this could be working together for my good because I had the death of a loved one and all these things. That's not working together for your good. That's a devil that stole from you. Don't believe lies. Don't ever attribute evil things to God. God's not involved with them. He brings blessing. Remember what the Bible says. The thief cometh not before to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy. I am come that you might have life and life more abundantly. That's the Lord. He brings good things. God is a good God. Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, over here in verse 9. As it's written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for who? For them that love them. Why haven't things entered possibly into your heart or maybe into someone's heart the things that God's prepared for them? Because they haven't met the conditions. You're not going to know things unless God reveals it to you. Who's God going to reveal things to? The ones that love Him. means as you love Him and walk in line with keeping His commandments, God's going to lead you step by step. He's going to reveal the things that He's prepared for you. He's going to bring that revelation. He's going to open the door. He's going to lead you and guide you to those things that He has for you. Praise God. God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. It's going to be revealed by the Spirit as the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God, the Holy Spirit will reveal these things as the Word is being re re uh, revealed to us as it talks about how uh, the, it talks about how we receive the Spirit of God that might know the things that are freely given to us of God. He's going to reveal these things to us. He'll open your eyes. Another blessing that we see for those that love Him. In 1 Corinthians 8, 3, it says, If any man love God, the same is known of him. That means who does God know? He knows the ones that love him. That means he really doesn't know the people that love him. Remember the one guy over in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23? Just, I don't know you. From whence are you? I don't, I've not known you. I don't know you. Why is that? Because he turned away from righteousness. We've already talked about that in the past. He turned away from righteousness and he was walking in lawlessness. God doesn't know you anymore. You walk in his ways, he knows you. If not, he doesn't know you. God knows you as you walk in the ways of the Lord. If any man love God because he's doing his word, keeping his commandments, the same is known of him. You want God to know you, and when he knows you, you better believe he's going to show up. He's going to manifest. He's going to take care of you. He's going to protect you. He's going to bless you. He's going to reveal things to you. He's going to come and work in your life. You're going to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with him because 
You love God. That is the condition. Praise God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. If I'm going to put, I'll put my faith in operation and I'll get all these great promises automatically because I put my faith in operation. Is that going to work? No. Galatians 5, 6 says, Faith which worketh by love. Or the word worketh is energio, which means it's put into operation by love. If you don't love God, your faith's going nowhere. If you have sin in the camp, is your faith going to work? No, it's not. Many people think, well, I'm just going get, to get, believe I receive and take all the promises, and I'll put my faith in operation, and they got one foot in the world, they walk in the ways of the flesh, and harboring some bitterness, and got some negative attitudes, and you know, kind of blame God for a few things that didn't work out quite right. All these little negatives in them. Uh-uh. We haven't come to the place of loving Him. Your faith isn't going to do anything. I wonder why my faith's not working. Your faith will work when you are operating in the love of God. You must, it works operating because of the fact that you are working literally through. This word by is actually a word dia. If you see below, dia means through in the Greek. It works through love. Not talking about by love, but through love because you are operating in love, the love towards God, of course. Ephesians chapter 3, the blessing. He talks about here, this is what Paul was praying for the church at Ephesus. He's praying some important things for them. He's praying for them to be strengthened with all might or power, this means, by his spirit in the inner man. He's praying that Christ would dwell in their heart by faith and that they would be rooted and grounded in love. You've got to be rooted and grounded, absolutely established in this. You're going to be fixed, established. The foundation laid because of the word that you hear and do is what this means in love. And you're able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, length, depth, and height and to know the love of Christ. You see, when you're established in the Word, you're going to know Him, you're going to know the love of Christ, who's going to reveal Himself to you, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. When God shows up, what's going to happen? You're going to be filled with everything of God, all the fullness of God. Look at these tremendous blessings of living by love and living and knowing and walking in line with His commandments and doing what He says, praise God. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, here in verse 15, speaking the truth, or this talks about the fact that we are telling the truth, teaching the truth in love, that people may grow up into Him in all things. That's why we've got to always speak things. It's always got to be in line with what is of love. We never can do things to condemn people, put them down, speak negatives, try to manipulate them. We've got to speak things in line with the truth. It's got to be in line with the Word, in love, that we may grow up into all things. What's going to be the result of the Word of God coming to us in love? We can grow up. That's why God wants us to grow up in all things, so that we can possess the promises. We're to grow in grace, grow in faith, grow in knowledge, grow in all these things. Increase and abound in love, so we become established and unblameable in holiness, our hearts uh, so we can uh, see the promises come to pass and we'll be holy before the Lord. Look at Ephesians 6. So we're going to grow up in all things. Verse 24. Grace be with all them automatically. No, it doesn't say that. Many people think that grace comes automatically. Well, I wonder if grace is supposed to be for me, how come I don't see God's favor in my life? Let's read the rest of it. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, in purity, that we love Him. Again, there's conditions, aren't there? For the grace of God, the favor of God, to manifest, praise the Lord. Colossians 2, verse 2. <clears throat> Colossians 2, 2, he says, that our hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Jesus Christ. We're going to be knit together in love and to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. Otherwise, God's riches are going to come to you. God has great riches. What riches are we talking about? We're not talking about the riches of this world. We're talking about the riches of Christ. All the things of God to be established in you, in your life. Look at James, chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. 
But when he's tried, he's going to receive the crown of life. Who's it for? Which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. That tells you that those who really love him, they conquer temptation. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be overcome it. In fact, this word actually tried is not a good word. It's not talking about this. Because this particular word is a word dokomos, which means to be accepted or well-pleasing uh, or to be approved. This is why Young's brings out, happy is the man who does endure temptation because becoming approved, why? Because he conquered the temptation. He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord did promise to those loving him. The promise is for us, loving him, and what's part of the promise? Of what's the part of the loving him? Conquer temptation, do the word, not give place to the enemy. And what's going to be the result of that? You're going to be approved before God. You're, you're not approved before God if we don't do what he says. If you're getting overtaken by temptation, well, that's no good. Jesus de dealt with the temptation. It's written and overcame. He wants you to overcome temptation. Watch and pray so you don't enter into it. And so what's going to happen? You're going to get the crown of life. But notice, it is tied to into the condition of you overcoming and conquering temptation and being approved of God. Here's another great promise, James 2.5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? We see this phrase again, to them that love him, to those that have met the conditions. Heirs of the kingdom. It's a promise. Is it automatic? No. Remember, the ones that are all the works, walking the works of the flesh and people that are walking in all kinds of sin, can they enter into the kingdom? No. It's a promise for everybody, but what's the conditions? For those that love him to be heirs. It's part of your inheritance, but it's not automatic unless we do what he says. 1 John 2, verse 10. Here he gives another great promise. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. That means we don't fall. No falling, no stumbling, no getting trapped by the enemy and no uh, uh, you know, destructive things happening. So if you walk in love, you're not going to stumble. You're not going to fall. You're going to see great blessings that come. 1 John 3, verse 14. We know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That means if you don't love your brother, you haven't passed, you're not abiding in life. You're abiding in death. Doesn't matter whether you're born again or not. He goes on and says, who hates his brother, he's a murderer. And you know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This is written to the church. These people that think that, well, I'm born again, you know, I got my ticket to heaven, everything's fine, I know I'm saved forever, I hate my brother, I can't stand the guy. Uh, you don't have any eternal life in you. You've been deceived by the lying teaching. If you aren't right, you're in trouble at the end of your days. Whoso hates his brother is a murderer. No murderer, the murderers, they, they, don't, they end up in the lake of fire. Uh, they have, and has no eternal life abiding in him. He is in trouble. It's also, we see, it's, it's 1 John chapter 4, one last verse here. Verse 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love, perfected love, casts out fear, because fear has torment. Where's fear come from? The devil. It's a spirit of fear. Remember, God's not given us a spirit of fear. It comes from the devil. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. When you're perfected in love, you believe God's word, you're acting on his word, you're totally trusting his word, you have absolute confidence in him, you know he's going to perform his word in your life. Why would you have any fear of anything? Fear is coming because, oh, the enemy's made some inroads. You're responding to what the enemy is doing. You're looking at circumstances the enemy has stirred up or whatever's come against you. Instead, if you walk in the love of God because you develop a personal relationship with him, you keep his commandments, you do what he says, you come to the perfection in love, fear is eliminated in your life. You say, boy, I got fears in my life. Well, we got some work to do. We got to cast out all those demons. We got to get ourselves established in the word. And you're going to get perfected in the love of God. And you're going to come to the place where fear is going to be eradicated and eliminated from your life. 
it's going to be no more anymore. That is what God will accomplish. Look at these great blessings that we see to those that love him. His covenant and mercy manifest, turning curses into blessing, living, multiplying us. We're gonna, enemies are going to perish. We're going to shine like, you know, like the sun, essentially, just shining the blessings of God. He's going to preserve us. He's going to reward us. He's going to deliver us. He's going to honor us. He's going to bring forth great things in our life. He was going to give us great peace, and nothing's going to offend us. We're going to prosper. We're going to, uh, he's going to, uh, we love, it says he loves those that love him. We're going to, he's going to manifest his love to us. We're going to inherit in substance. Our treasures are going to be filled. These are great blessings that he wants to bring forth. Things are going to work for your good that God does according to what, the call, according to his purpose, the things he wants to bring forth for all the things that you prayed and you're walking in line because you've met the conditions. He's going to reveal the things prepared for you that you might not know yet because you haven't come to the place for God to be able to reveal them yet. You're going to be known of God. Yeah, he knows people that really love him. Your faith is going to work instead of wondering why my faith's not working. You're going to get filled with the fullness of God. You're going to grow up into Christ in all things. You're going to see the grace and favor of God because you have real love and sincerity and genuineness. Your heart's going to be knitted together with God and the believers. You're going to have absolute assurance and of understanding, confidence with God. You're going to have a crown of life, and you're going to be heirs of the kingdom. You're going to conquer all temptations. No occasion of stumbling in you. You're going to know you've passed from death into life. You're going to see your prayers answered because you keep his commandments and do the things pleasing his sight. And fear is going to be gone from your life because his love, perfect love, perfected love, Get rid of fear forever. We've got to walk in love and love God as he says. Put his word first place. Get the commandments of God. Walk in his commandments. Be a doer of his word. Eyes on him. God is going to show up in your life. If I do it tomorrow, will he show up tomorrow? It's going to be a lifestyle. He's going to find out. If we start doing it every day, I don't know when he's going to show up. It might be a week, month. Six months, he's going to prove you and find out the sincerity of your love, whether you're really walking it or whether, you know, or you have a genuous about it. Is God really your source and you're putting him first place? All I can tell you is that as you put God's word first place, he will show up and he will manifest himself and he will perform his mercy and his covenant in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that brings the revelation of the blessings that will come forth to them that love him. I will love you. Evidenced by, not just my words, but my actions, my works, my fruit, the things that I do. I will keep your New Testament commandments. I will walk in your ways. I will be obedient in all things. I will hearken diligently unto your voice. I will walk in all of your ways. I thank you, Lord, that as I meet the conditions, I know that you perform your word of the covenant because you swore with an oath. You swore by yourself, and you will perform your word. And I am going to perform the word of the covenant and show that I really love you. The sincerity of my love, the genuineness of it, it will be proved, and it will be shown, and I will walk in your ways, showing I love you. And as you see that, I thank you for all these blessings that you will bring to pass to them that love him. I'm going to meet your conditions, and I know that your covenant, promises, your mercy, and all these wonderful blessings will come to pass in my life. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to meet your conditions, and I know you're going to perform it in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Such an important message. Because so many people, they tried to apply principle A, B, and C that so-and-so taught, and wonder why it didn't happen. You know, I did what they said. I did a couple scriptures. Great. How about all the other ones that you've ignored and you aren't doing? 
or you got sin in the camp and, you know, oh, it's the whole package, isn't it? It's the whole deal. So God is doing a work in us. And as the word is coming forth in all these areas, we're going to bring forth fruit. We're going to bring forth fruit in every area, fruit of love, fruit of joy, fruit of peace. All these things are going to get established in you. All your relationship problems are going to be over if you get established in this. Long-suffering, you'll never have a short fuse. You're going to see all these things. We're going to be, get all these things, your relationship problems are going to be over. You're going to put the Word of God first place. You're going to have blessed marriages, blessed relationships, blessed friendships. You're going to be blessed everywhere you go. And I'm not going to give place to the devil because God is going to manifest himself because you are a doer of the Word. Father, thank you for all that you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of your Word and to them that love you, which will be us. We will see your promises come to pass. Thank you for performing them in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. we got one other message regarding this on the subject of love, regarding what God, and that is on Wednesday night, we're going to talk about what God loves and what God hates. We're to love the things he loves, and we're to hate the things he hates. If you don't hate the things he hates, do you love God? No. I thought I wasn't supposed to hate anything. No, you're supposed to hate the things that he says to hate. Some people want to hate the wrong things, and they make a mistake. Now, we're not going to hate the things that we're not supposed to hate. So we're going to talk about the on Wednesday night, and that'll be important so we see all the things that we want, that we, God wants us to do, so we come in line with his word. And then on Sunday morning, we're going to be talking about loving one another and principles that are so important for us in all relationships in dealing with people so that we always walk in love and you will have no problems all the rest of your days and your life with relationships ever if you put these as you put these principles in operation in your life that's going to be sunday morning praise god if you need prayer I invite you to come forward be endure the word watch god perform it in your life god bless you're dismissed